and we are live. I want to thank you all for coming. And um, if you can hear me, everybody wave. Good. I know you're out there. Thank you all. Um, so once again, thank you all for coming. Um, this, uh, my name is Ken. I help organize the North City Tech Meetup. We meet uh, once a month, usually the first Monday of each month. Uh, very informal group. The whole idea was to avoid having to drive downtown for other meetups in the Seattle area. Um, I know on uh, this particular event, we have a number of people from out of town, um, which is great. That's the upside to the virus is uh, we can bring in speakers from all over uh, and attendees. But the main purpose of this was a chance for people to socialize without having to drive downtown if you don't already work downtown. Um, and um, but now with Zoom, um, we're all here. So um, let's see, we don't yet have a speaker lined up for next month. I'm um, trying to get uh, an astronomer from the University of Hawaii um, on board, but that's not confirmed yet. So I'll let everybody know as soon as we um, have something confirmed, but we are going to do it a week late because I don't want to do this the day before the election. I think we're all going to be heavily distracted. So um, the November meetup will be the second Monday um, of November. And now without too much further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Ken Sheriff. Ken has been um, reverse engineering uh, computers and um, other hardware, including chips, um, chargers, uh, kind of you name it. Um, if you have not been following him on uh, uh, Twitter, I recommend it. And he has um, um, his, his reports are incredibly interesting and detailed. Um, and if you're at all interested in how we got to where computers are today, this is a good place to start. Um, I particularly like what he did with the, um, um, the Xerox Alto. I was very lucky in 1976, while I was still in college, we did a field trip to a place called Xerox Park and met Alan Kay and got to see and touch um, an alto and um, saw the first mouse and the um, ethernet and other devices. And I know my jaw hurt from hanging open for three days afterwards. Um, now, a couple of years later, someone else visited them and built a whole company around it, but that wasn't me. But it was fun to, to see that and fun to see these things um, reverse engineered and made working again. Um, so finally, um, today he'll be talking about the Apollo guidance um, con computer, which was kind of, a, a, at the time, a miracle of miniaturization, although uh, in today's uh, world that has less power than your um, wristwatch. Um, and, but I'll let him go into that in... Um, in more detail. And at this point, I'm going to um, turn it over to Ken, um, except to say that uh, we will take questions. I will be monitoring the waiting room and chat. And so if you have a question for Ken, um, put it in the chat room and I will try to keep an eye on that. Um, and then interrupt um, Ken. But if you don't see me, feel free to unmute and um, shout my name or wave at me or something. We now have 40 people online. So it's, um, I'll be spending a lot of time just kind of managing the group. Um, uh, but at this point, I'm going to let um, Ken take over. So um, right. go ahead, Ken. And thank you all for joining, me, joining us again. All right, well, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm going to talk about the Apollo guidance computer. This is the computer that was used um, to get to the moon for the Apollo missions, and it's quite an interesting machine. Now, now from the outside, it's not so interesting. It's just a, a painted metal box, um, weighs about 70 pounds, um, but its functionality is pretty amazing. Um, it it's a real-time computer. It provided the guidance, navigation, and control to get to the moon. Uh, one strange thing is it's a 15-bit computer. Nowadays, that seems like a bizarre word size, um, but back then, you know, 14 bits wasn't enough accuracy. 16 was more than you need. 
So to save power, save space, they went with 15 bits. And it had a small amount of RAM and then a small amount of um, ROM to hold the code. It was pretty compact for its size, under one cubic foot, um, weighed 70 pounds, which is still pretty heavy if you're carrying it around. Uh, power consumption was pretty low. Uh, they, they say it was the first um, integrated circuit computer, although there's also claims that the Minuteman guidance computer was first. So I haven't been able to sort that out. And its it speed was pretty slow by modern standards, running 40, 43,000 instructions per second. So when you open up the computer, this is what you see inside. Um, it opens into two trays. Um, each tray is um, filled with some, some modules. Um, these are where the circuitry are. There's a connector on the front to connect the computer up to the rest of the spacecraft. And so I'm going to go into more detail about how it's constructed and what we did to restore it. So uh, the Apollo guidance computer was really the brain of the spacecraft. As you can see from the diagram, it was connected to a display for the astronauts to interact with. It controlled the engines. It communicated with the ground. And it also um, kept track of the location in space using the inertial measurement unit. Now, since the inertial measurement unit gets mentioned a lot in this, I'll go into a bit more detail on it. Um, the basic idea is if you want to know where you are in space, they didn't have GPS back then. So what they did for guidance was they used um, gyroscopes and accelerometers. If you know what direction you're going and how far, far you're accelerating, you can integrate that and keep track of your exact location. Um, so one of the key jobs of the Apollo guidance computer was to keep track of the data from the inertial measurement unit and constantly update your location in space. So the gyroscopes did drift a little over time. So periodically, they'd have to recalibrate it by pointing a special telescope at, at specific stars. And then um, the AGC would recompute the position based on the angle to the stars. So um, some background for Apollo in case there's um, young people. Um, 1961, John F. Kennedy had a famous speech saying, we want to land a man on the moon before the decade is out. And then they succeeded in doing that, landing Apollo 11 on the moon in 1969. So Apollo really started in 1961 with that speech. And computers at the time were much larger than, than nowadays. A common computer was the IBM 7094. This was used. Um, this is the one in the movie Hidden Figures. Um, if you haven't seen that movie, you should go see it. Um, these computers were built with um, circuit boards like this one, thousands of these boards with a few transistors on each board. So the computers were very large. They ran in batch processing. You'd read data off punch cards or tape, um, run the computer for a while, and then print out your result. And so these were transistorized. Um, integrated circuit wasn't even invented until 1958, um, just three years before the Apollo project started. So um, now I'd like to just review the components of the Apollo spacecraft. Um, at the top is the lunar module. Um, this is the only part that landed on the moon. It would separate from the command and service modules, go down to the moon's surface, then come back up, and you'd have to rendezvous. And then the astronauts would transfer into the command module. The command module is that um, cone-shaped part in the middle. And, and that's the only part that came back to Earth. That's what you see in the splashdowns. And then finally, the cylindrical part at the bottom is the service module. Um, that's the rocket that um, got them to moon orbit and then back to Earth. Um, that provided the power, the oxygen, the communication. And if you've seen Apollo 13, um, that's where the oxygen tank exploded. So now the Apollo guidance computer was a key computer in getting to the moon, but not the only computer. Um, there were five computers on the rocket overall. There was an Apollo guidance computer in the command module, another Apollo guidance computer in the lunar lander. The lunar lander also had a separate computer, the abort guidance system. The job of that computer was if something goes wrong, make sure you can get back off the moon and rendezvous with the command module. And then on the Saturn V rocket itself, there were two computers. Um, one was the launch vehicle digital computer, which was a guidance computer built by IBM to steer the Saturn V rocket. And then there was a 100-pound um, flight control computer 
which was an analog computer that provided fine tuning rapid response for controlling the engines. So, um, team that was during the Apollo guidance computer, there were four of us. Um, Mike Stewart is this um, Apollo guidance computer genius. He's been studying the computer for years and knows pretty much everything about it. Um, Carl Clanch, second in the picture, uh, me, and then Mark Verdiel, who you may know as Curious Mark on YouTube. He does a lot of restoration videos there. So how did we restore the computer? Well, most of the Apollo guidance computer, even after 50 years, everything worked perfectly. We tested all the capacitors and the power supply. Everything was fine. Power supply worked exactly. Most of the components, you know, modern things, after 20 years, they start to fall apart. But it turns out if you spend a fortune on aerospace grade components and test them thoroughly, they just keep working. So that was the good part. Um, there are a few problems that caused us a lot of trouble. Um, one was a broken wire in the core memory that we spent a lot of work on but weren't able to fix. Um, the second was that this Apollo guidance computer didn't come with any of the core ropes, any of the ROMs, so we had to um, simulate those. Um, there were a few diodes that failed that we had to replace. And then finally, the Apollo guidance computer uses these obsolete connectors that aren't available anywhere. So that was a big difficulty in hooking things up to the computer. So now where did we get this computer and um, why is it here on Earth? Um, well, before the Apollo mission landed on the moon, NASA needed to test out the lunar lander. So what they did was they built one that they called Lunar Test Article 8. Then they built a giant vacuum chamber big enough to hold it. Um, they put the lunar lander and the astronauts and the computer in this vacuum chamber for a few days, um, sucked out all the air, exposed it to heat, exposed it to cold, and made sure everything functioned. So the computer we restored didn't go into space. It was used for ground testing. And, and now this, um, th this lunar lander LTA-8 is now hanging in the museum in Houston. And if you zoom in really closely on, on the door to it and look in, what you see is this empty spot where there should be the Apollo guidance computer. So although this lunar lander is now in the museum, they took out the Apollo guidance computer and it made, it way, it made its way to us. How did that happen? Well, that brings us to um, Jimmy Locke. Um, he worked briefly at NASA in the 60s, and then in the early 70s, he went to this um, junkyard in Houston and saw some space stuff he recognized. So he ended up buying two tons of it. Um, he's got like rocket engines and all sorts of random stuff. And in this collection, he found an Apollo guidance computer. So he's been holding on to it since the 70s. And a couple of years ago, he decided that it would be cool to restore it in time for the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. So he talked to some people who talked to other people who talked to Mike and me. And so we ended up restoring his computer. And he managed to dig up the receipt where this computer was scrapped. So it's all legit. Um, you know, he didn't get this um, through illicit means. It was um, NASA scrapped it when they were done with it, and that's how it ended up in the junkyard. Um, this is the, the, re the um, receipt for scrapping it, signed by Eldon Hall, the inventor of the Apollo guidance computer. And you can see here that the original cost was $275,800. So next, I'd like to talk a bit about the hardware. Um, so the computer is divided into two trays, tray A on the left, is mostly the logic and the interfaces. This is where the CPU is, the digital stuff, and then all the interfacing to the rest of the spacecraft. Tray B on the right holds the core memory, the core rope memory, and the support circuitry for that. And so then the two halves um, fit together. And if you look on the left of tray A, you'll see a bunch of what looks like random wiring. Um, those are the power supplies. So the Apollo guidance computer used switching power supplies. Um, nowadays, your phone charger uses a switching power supply because it's small and efficient. Um, but back then, switching power supplies were very rare, pretty much just used for aerospace applications. So it had two power supplies, um, one providing 4 volts, one providing 14 volts. And now the construction of these circuits is pretty unusual. They use something called cordwood modules. And the idea there is that instead of putting components under a printed circuit board, 
what you do is you mount the components perpendicularly through the module. So your resistors, your capacitors, they're stacked together kind of like um, cordwood in a, in a pile of logs. And then on either side, um, wires are welded to the components. They're not soldered. Um, they wired them for more reliability. And then finally, the whole thing would be encased in epoxy to keep it solid for um, the launch into space. And since our computer wasn't um, launched into space, it was used for ground testing. They didn't put the epoxy on, which made things a lot easier for us because we could see the components and test them out. So um, next, I'll move on to the core memory, um, one of the major problems we faced. So um, this core memory module, it's you know about, about this big. Um, it holds 2K words, about 4 kilobytes. Um, they use magnetic cores. These are tiny little rings. Each ring holds one bit, and it's magnetized. Magnetized one way for a one, magnetized the other way for a zero. It has wires threaded through it. These wires allow you to select one particular core out of the collection to read and write. Um, so they took these core planes, they folded them all up accordion style, encased the whole thing in epoxy, and created the module that you see here. So um, back in the 60s, um, core memory was a pretty common thing. Most computers used it. You know, that's where core dump comes from. So anyway, the problem was during testing of this core memory module, we discovered there was a broken wire somewhere inside. So we took x-rays to try to find the broken wire. Um, we hoped we could find the wire, drill our way through the epoxy, fix the wire. Um, but despite um, studying the x-rays, we um, couldn't find where the broken wire was. So measurements showed it was like several inches inside. So it was in the middle of this tangle of tiny wires. So we realized that we were, wouldn't be able to fix that wire. Um, so what we did instead is um, the module has 15 bits plus one parity bit. So we rewired the computer slightly to disable the parity and then replace the bad bit with a parity bit. So we were actually able to use the, use the core memory just without having parity. Okay, and, if, if, if I may interrupt, how did you know there was a broken wire in there in the first place? Um, well, well, when we got this computer, you know, we didn't just power it up and see what happened. Um, we like carefully measured like every every connection, measured every continuity. So, so for all the all, all the all the pins on the module, we would we would measure and make sure that the resistance was what it was supposed to be, and then we discovered that there was one that should be a, should be a connection through the module, but it was an open circuit. And so in that way, we realized that there was, there was something wrong. And you know, we realized that only 15 out of the 16 bits were going to work. Um, so by doing this rewiring, um, we were able to um, use the core memory. We didn't have parity protection, so it probably wouldn't be safe to go into space with it. But since we were on Earth, you know, it worked out OK. Um, the next thing is the core rope module. Now, core memory is pretty normal, but core rope was a very, very unusual way of, of storing data in ROM. So there were six of these modules, and these held all the software that was used on your space mission. Now, the interesting thing about core rope is that the program was physically woven into the module when they constructed it. There were 192 wires through each one of these cores. If a wire went through the core, that would be a one. If the wire went around the core, that would be a zero. So they had to they had to freeze their software, you know, multiple weeks in advance, and then send it off to be manufactured into this module. And you know, there was no way to patch your software afterwards. If there was a bug, you had to like basically build a new module. And so here this shows how they, they built it. Um, women would pass a needle back and forth through the cores to um, put in the wires. And then th they also had use of of this um, semi semi automated system that would read the data off of a uh, paper tape and then move an aperture over to the right spot and then the woman would feed the needle through either through the core or around the core and so this is how they programmed it with the specific the specific data for a specific program so it was a, a very tedious and expensive way of putting your software into rom but it was reliable and you know once it was built there's no way your data is going to get you know, bit flipped. Um, 
Another failure we encountered um, was the current switch module. Now, what this module does is provides the high, high current pulses into the core memory um, to read or write um, data. And we discovered that there was a, a couple broken circuits in here. Now, unfortunately, this module was encased in epoxy. So we had to mill our way through the epoxy and then pick away at the bits of epoxy um, to find the, the bad components and then um, replace them. So now the interesting thing is um, all, all of the computer worked perfectly and had no epoxy except for these two modules, the core memory and the current switch, which failed and had epoxy. Um, so uh, Mike did some checking of the serial numbers, and it turns out that the serial numbers for those modules don't match the computer we have. So our suspicion is that somebody else's Apollo guidance computer failed, and so they, they put the failed modules into this computer and took the good modules for their own computer and sort of used this one as, you know, as a repair one. So we figure the good modules are out there somewhere, and we just need to, like, find who, who took them, you know, 50 years ago. So next I'll talk about the logic modules. So in 1958, the integrated circuit was invented. And then just four years later, they decided to bet the entire moon landing on this new untested technology of the integrated circuit. So it was a you know, very risky move, but they realized that this was the only way they'd get enough um, density of the circuit, make it lightweight enough to get to the moon. So there were um, just two types of integrated circuits they used. They figured if they used two types and tested those very thoroughly, that would be much better than having multiple types where they wouldn't, get, wouldn't be able to figure out the reliability as much. So the first type was a, a NOR gate. Originally, they started with a single three input NOR gate. Then they moved to a dual three input NOR gate. So that, this is a very simple chip, just two gates. It contains six transistors and eight resistors. So these were very primitive integrated circuits, but they were still considerably better than using raw integrated um, raw transistors. The second integrated circuit was a sense amplifier that amplified the tiny signals from the core memory. And this was apparently the first analog um, amplifier integrated circuit. So what I'd like to emphasize here is that there weren't any microprocessors. The processor was built on about 5,600 NOR gates. Um, these gates um, were, you had 240 gates per module. The modules all looked pretty much like the one here. Um, the internal wiring was different, but from the outside, they all just looked like rows of NOR gates. Um, the construction technology was pretty advanced for the time. They used um, surface, mount, surface mount printed circuit boards with seven layers. So it, it's something that really didn't make its way to the, the commercial world until decades later. So here's a brief um, look at the architecture of the Apollo guidance computer. Um, it's you know, pretty simple as computers go, but definitely not trivial. In yellow, there's some control circuitry. The arithmetic unit is in the middle in green. There's purple um, IO circuitry. Um, one of the main things about the Apollo guidance computer is it had you know, hundreds of IO ports to talk to the different parts of the spacecraft. Um, in, in red here, we have the registers and the memory control. And then in blue on the right, we have the fixed ROM memory and the erasable core memory. So I'd like to talk a bit about the, the CPU. As I mentioned, it was 15 bits, um, had a large focus on I.O. Um, it included a lot of counters that um, I.O. devices could update in the background. So the, for instance, the IMU could update these counters without um, having to explicitly interrupt the CPU. There was a lot of error checking in the CPU, um, not just parity. It had watchdog timers. It had voltage checks. Um, basically, if it detected any sort of fault, it would issue an alarm because they were very concerned about reliability. Now, modern computers use um, two's complement for storing negative numbers, um, but the Apollo guidance computer used one's complement. Now, the strange thing about that is it gave you both positive zero and negative zero. So you had two different values of zero to deal with. Now, one thing that made the restoration a lot easier is that we had um, a whole pile of, we had the complete schematics and documentation for it. Now, the schematics are just, you know, hundreds of pages of, of NOR gates, just so many NOR gates. Um, he, here is one page of the schematic. I've zoomed in on a, a NOR gate latch in the upper left. 
um, but you can see there's not a whole lot of structure or abstraction. It's basically just this large sea of NOR gates. And here's a photo of uh, Mike and Mark hard at work during the restoration on the Apollo guidance computer on the left there. We've attached a whole bunch, whole bunch of wires to it. And we've connected it to the logic analyzer. Uh, Mark is studying the logic analyzer. Um, it was about at this point that we got it to run its first instructions and realized that this restoration uh, might actually work out. Um, next, I'd like to talk about how the Apollo guidance computer was connected to the outside world, how the astronauts communicated with it. They use something called the DISCI. This is the display and keyboard. Um, it had a, a small keypad that um, had large buttons that astronauts could push with their gloves on. It had an electroluminescent display with displaying a few lines of numbers, had some status lights. And now the interesting thing about the interaction is it used this verb and noun structure. An astronaut would an, an uh, astronaut would enter a verb for what they want to do, and then a noun for what they want to do it too. And I'll go into a little more detail on that. Uh, we, we couldn't find a real disk to use during this restoration, so Carl um, built a replica that we could hook up to the Apollo guidance computer. So um, example of verbs and nouns, the, um, the astronauts had to memorize about 80 verbs and 90 nouns. A verb could be anything from display a particular decimal value to enable your engines for landing. Um, the nouns were things like one noun 43 would be the latitude, longitude, and altitude of the spacecraft. 47 was how much does the vehicle currently weigh. And 70 would pick out a particular star if you want to align your IMU against that star. So now connecting to the, the Apollo guidance computer was one of the big problems we faced. Um, all the modules had, had these gold pins and you can see these two connectors on the front had um, matching sockets. Unfortunately, these connectors were very popular for a brief period in the 1960s in the, in the aerospace world, and then they entirely vanished. We looked everywhere and couldn't find connectors that were at all compatible with the Apollo guidance computer. So these connectors were called the mini wasp. Um, fortunately, we had blueprints um, from NASA on how they were constructed. The other fortunate thing is that uh, Mark on the team was CTO at a company called Samtech who built connectors and he managed to talk them into spending a whole pile of money to build us custom connectors, custom pins that would fit the Apollo guidance computer. So they um, built these pins, um, had them gold plated for us. And in this photo, I'm mounting the pins into a circuit board that we could then plug into the Apollo guidance computer. So once we had those pins, we could connect peripherals to the computer. Uh, we built FPGA boards that would allow us to communicate with the Apollo guidance computer. Uh, we could uh, monitor the Apollo guidance computer via laptop. Uh, I built a BeagleBone based board that could plug into the Apollo guidance computer. And Carl built this plug board that you can see on the right so we could attach various peripherals and wire things up to the Apollo guidance computer to simulate everything it was connected to. So the result of all this restoration, we finally got the Apollo guidance computer up and running. Um, once we had it running, we um, took it to Florida where Eldon Hall, its creator lived. Um, you can see Eldon in the picture here. Um, he was delighted to see the computer running 50 years later. Um, so it was you know, quite nice to take this restored computer back to its inventor. Um, next, I'd like to talk a bit about the software development for the Apollo guidance computer. Now, if any of you have done software development, you'll be familiar with the, the idea behind this quote from the director. The effort needed for the software turned, about, turned out to be grossly underestimated. They figured it would just be a matter of implementing a few guidance equations but it turned into 1400 person years of effort. So they had a large team building the software. Um, here's the famous picture of Margaret Hamilton with a pile of the software binders stacked up. Um, we were actually able to get our hands on some of these binders, um, scan in the software. And so that's now available online. So it, it really was a complex software engineering job. Um, they ha had to implement a real time operating system it supported um, multiple jobs, scheduled them with priority, 
It also had an interpreter, a virtual machine to make their coding easier. And then there was the actual software to run the mission. And this was all implemented in assembly language. So they, they didn't even have the benefits of, of Fortran or something. The operating system was called the executive and it allowed the Apollo guidance computer to run eight jobs at once. It used a priority based scheduling. So the most important tasks would be handled immediately. Things like making sure you don't crash into the moon while updating displays, communicating with earth, that could be a lower priority. Um, one thing they implemented that was very important is a checkpoint restart feature. The software would constantly write um, checkpoints to memory so that if it had to restart, it could just continue right from where it left, where it was. Um, it wouldn't have to start from the beginning. And then finally, it managed a whole bunch of real-time tasks through a waitlist, so you could schedule things to run every 100 milliseconds, for instance. Um, the, the next interesting thing was this interpreter they built. They didn't write everything just in the raw assembly language. They built this virtual machine that had 70 new opcodes that were um, more dense and easier to program. Um, these opcodes were things like um, multiplying a matrix by a vector, dealing with um, double or triple position numbers, um, and implementing trig functions. So this made it much easier to write code. A sample of the interpreter code is on the right. Um, this is um, doing some sines and cosines based on the Earth's location, the Moon's location, and the Sun's location. So you can see it's doing things like converting a vector to a unit vector, taking arc sine, taking cosine. So the interpreter let them write their software at a much higher level than just dealing with um, raw data in memory. You could deal with matrices. Now the development environment, um, the software was assembled on this Honeywell 1800 mainframe. Uh, they had a, a very complex um, environment. It was a bit like GitHub. If you wanted to make a change to the code, you would put your change on some punch cards. Um, you'd run the cards um, through this um, mainframe. It would update the, the master copy of the code. It would keep track of who made what changes if they were authorized to make it. It would assemble the code into binary. Then it would produce a punch tape that was then used to manufacture the core rope. Um, the mission software consisted of two completely different sets of software, um, one for the lunar module and one for the command module. For the lunar module, you had about 34 different programs you had to run, everything from a program to realign the IMU, program 63 started your descent to the moon, program 20 got you back um, into space, and then there was a bunch of um, software to handle various abort or problem cases. And then the command module, had different programs to go through the launch, get you to the moon, and then back to Earth. So during the moon landing of Apollo 11, they ran into a problem with the computer. About 30,000 feet above the surface, alarms started going off. The computer reported a 1202 alarm. The astronauts were not quite sure what to do. They asked mission control. Uh, mission control, they were puzzled for a bit, but they decided to go ahead with the landing. Uh, this was a very serious problem because it could have aborted the landing entirely, um, but they decided to proceed. So the, the problem here was that um, the rendezvous radar and the computer ran off different power supplies. And if you had bad luck, these two power supplies would be slightly out of phase. And this would start generating um, false interrupts from the rendezvous radar, thousands of interrupts a second. And this um, and overloaded the computer. Now, fortunately, they had this checkpoint restart design. So during the landing, the computer restarted five times, but it could immediately keep going where it left off. Uh, we did some of these um, program alarms in, on the actual computer, and you can't even notice when it restarts unless you're watching carefully. It, it restarts that fast, just like within a second. So you know, the astronauts were a little alarmed when, you know, these things happened, but um, the landing succeeded. Um, so he here's a picture of, of us um, using an old Tektronix oscilloscope to debug some problems with the Apollo guidance computer. Um, if you look in the very upper left of this picture, you can see a Xerox Alto that, that Ken mentioned earlier. So anyway, once we had this computer working, what did we do with it? Um, well, the first thing we did um, was we could simulate a moon landing with it. There's a group that's written um, 
lunar module software. So you can run it on your PC and simulate a landing. It, it simulates all the switches of the real lunar lander. Um, we rewrote this so it would talk to the real Apollo guidance computer rather than a simulated one. So we could run the genuine Apollo guidance computer running the genuine moon landing software and then control it through this panel. And here you can see a picture of, of Mike doing a simulated landing on the moon. And it's a pretty complicated process landing on the moon. There's a whole lot of switches you have to set right to make sure it goes okay. But um, Mike, Mike got it down pat. He did a bunch of landings, all went fine. Um, Ken, uh, next... um, so did you actually, or did someone actually physically implement all the buttons and the controls? So this was, um, at that point, that was exactly what the astronauts were using? So, so um, th these buttons and controls are are um, on on, a on, on your screen. So it's it, it's not like physical buttons, but all the buttons of the real lunar module are on this on this screen and act as they would in real life. So those are some of the hundreds of in inputs and outputs that you talked about. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So the next thing we could do is uh, read some core ropes. Um, there's a couple museums that had core ropes, but they didn't know what was on it. The Computer History Museum, MIT Museum. And we also talked to some people who worked on, on this project in the 1960s and they had core ropes at home. So we could plug them into our Apollo guidance computer, read the data off them, and then recover different versions of the moon landing software that you know, had never been seen in the past 50 years. Um, we could reload them into the laptop and then we could put them on the web so people can study them, look at how things changed from version to version. So by doing this, we were able to you know, do our part to preserve software history. Um, the next thing we, we did with the Apollo guidance computer was write our own software for it. So back, back in the 60s, the way it worked is they had this, this um, refrigerator sized box called the monitor. And it was basically a debugger that plugged into the Apollo guidance computer. It was kind of like GCC or GDB that you could set breakpoints, you could single step through your software, you could examine memory. So this is how they did their debugging. Um, fortunately, things are more modern now. Somebody wrote an IDE for the Apollo guidance computer. So you can write your software using a nice IDE. You can run it on a simulated Apollo guidance computer, um, get all the bugs out and make software development much easier. Uh, it's it's still pretty hard. Um, the instruction set is is very strange. You have uh, 15 bit words, which has a three bit opcode and 12 bit address. Um, that address isn't big enough to access all the memory, so memory is broken into these 256 word banks. And to switch from bank to bank, you have to do this nasty bank switching to access whatever part of memory you want. Um, you might notice that three bits isn't enough to access all 34 instructions. So they use a bunch of prefixes and some hacks to cram 34 instructions into the, into the word. And now the instructions themselves are very strange, even by 1960s standards. So for instance, if you want to do a for loop, you use this instruction called count, compare, and skip. This one instruction increments a counter, compares it to the value you want, then it will skip to one of four different locations based on whether the comparison is positive, negative, positive zero, or negative zero. Another weird instruction is TS, which transfers the accumulator to storage. So that's a common instruction. It seems pretty normal, except what they also added to this is it handles overflow. When you do a transfer to storage, if your previous addition instruction overflowed, transfer to storage will also jump. So they basically crammed two functions into one instruction. And then if you want to shift something, um, shift a word left or right, they don't have an instruction for that. Instead, they have this special magic memory location. And if you write to that location, your number will read back shifted different direction depending on which location. So um, coding for this was kind of, kind of a matter of trying to you know, deal with these weird instructions. Um, but I decided, you know, what would be the most pointlessly bizarre thing to implement on the Apollo guidance computer? And I decided that um, Bitcoin mining was the thing I'd do. So what I did is I implemented the SHA-256 hash um, algorithm in the 
of Hologan's computer assembly code. You can see a bit of it here. Um, now it was very inconvenient that you have 15-bit words in the in the Apollo guidance computer, but you're dealing with 256-bit things with the Bitcoin hashing. So that was something hard to work around. The other problem was that the memory pages are very small, but if you go over a memory page, it's very much slower and difficult. So I had to like optimize my code so it would just barely fit into one memory page. And so if, if you're familiar with modern Bitcoin hardware, um, it, do, it does giga hashes. You do billions of hashes per second to try to uh, mine a block. Uh, the Apollo guidance computer was a bit slower. It took over five seconds for every hash. So to act successfully mine a block would take a million times the age of the universe. So it's not practical as a Bitcoin mining platform, but it shows it's, it's possible. So, so here's a shot of it running. Um, we had a verb 65, the Bitcoin mine verb. Now it thinks for a few seconds, it's churning away and there it's done a hash and it prints out the hash value in octal. So there you can see the, the digits of the hash and th that's how you could mine your Bitcoins if you were you know, in space. So to wrap up, uh, the Apollo guidance computer is basically what made the integrated circuit industry what it is today. When they started, integrated circuits were this very pretty much research niche project. Um, the Apollo project ended up using 60% of America's entire production of integrated circuits in 1963. So basically, it created the demand. It forced integrated circuits to become reliable. So without Apollo, it's hard to know where the integrated circuit industry would be. Um, it used very advanced hardware and software for its time, you know, real-time operating system, checkpoint restore, and it was basically the first fly-by-wire control system. And finally, it had this very limited um, computing power, you know, 43,000 instructions per second, but still that was enough to go to the moon. You know, nowadays, our computers are you know, thousands or millions of times more powerful because of Moore's law. So it's kind of like, what can we do with our computers of today? If they could get to the moon back then, you know, we should be able to do pretty much anything now. Um, so if you want more information, um, you can, we have a bunch of videos that Mark created on his YouTube channel. Um, the Virtual AGC project has a lot of info. Um, we got written up in the Wall Street Journal. And then finally, um, you can take a look at my blog, um, send me email. And I'd like to thank our sponsor, Samtech, who built these very expensive pins for us, and PCBWay, who made some very complex printed circuit boards for the peripherals that we attached to the Apollo guidance computer. So um, that, that's the end of my talk. Um, any questions? Let's see. So we have a question in here. Um, what manufacturer created it? Um, it, it was built by um, Raytheon. And I have a question. Um, so this was an interesting instruction set. Uh, you got to meet what you call who you call the inventor of the computer. Now, typically, there's more than one person involved. So, was this person responsible for the ultimate design of, say, the opcodes, um, or do you, um, or do you have any insight of how they came up with this particular um, instruction set uh, design? So, so when I say the inventor, um, Eldon Hall was the the leader of the project. Um, there were, of course, many, many people involved, uh, but he, 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 was the, he was the head of it. Um, as, as far as the instruction set, um, you know, they were very limited by the, the hardware as to what they could do. And it's sort of, um, my interpretation is that, you know, the, uh, they started off with something basic and then they started cramming in more and more functionality, um, but they didn't have space for new instructions, so they ended up with these instructions that did several things like transfer to storage but also check for overflow and then maybe do a jump so it you know it it kind of show looking at it it kind of shows you know layers and layers of hacks put onto the instructions um, you know they also they were basically just what they wanted to do is you know get the project working they weren't so um, concerned with making it you know architecturally beautiful um, they didn't have to support, you know, a whole product line of these supported in the future, so they could do just whatever it took to get the job done.
So we have a couple of questions relating to reliability. Uh, was it fault tolerant? I know you said it had parity. And did they test it for radiation hardness or how did they do so? Um, so, so there was there was no fault tolerance, which was um, kind of a controversial thing. Um, you know, the, the, their belief was that you test the components you're putting in, you make sure they're reliable, and then, you know, you just, you have the confidence that it's going to work. Um, you know, very early on in the project, they, they actually had these designs where they would have modules that the astronauts could replace. They even had plans where the astronauts would have soldering irons so they could like, you know, solder in new components. You know, obviously that was a bad idea. Um, interestingly, the launch vehicle digital computer that was used on Saturn V um, that, that controlled the rocket, um, that was built by a team at IBM and they took a totally different approach where everything was done with three copies and then the circuitry would vote on it. So that they basically had um, three copies of the ALU, th three copies of the various circuit and then these voting chips that would take, you know, two out of three, whichever was most popular. So that, you know, that was designed for fault tolerance. So there was really these interesting that they took these two totally different approaches in the same space mission. And, they and, and there was a second part of the question. Yeah, about radiation, you know, um, the core memory um, and the rope memory, which is really core, um, those maintain those instructions even to today. Now those particular ones you had, had them been in space, but presumably they were um, radiation tolerant as well. Well, the, the the core memory, because it's like the, these magnetized metal rings, you know, it's pretty much resistant to radiation, pretty much resistant to anything. Um, you know, for the um, Challenger um, Challenger disaster, when the space shuttle um, blew up, they were able to recover the core memory from the bottom of the ocean and still read the data off it. So, so even oh, the shuttle still used core memory as well then. Um, the yeah, mid, yeah, midway through the project, they update, updated the shuttle computers to use um, silicon memory. Um, but for the first half of the shuttles, it was it was um, physical cores. So, and, and then for the integrated circuits, um, you know, modern MOS integrated circuits are pretty sensitive to to radiation. Um, but these um, these were bipolar transistors, which are much less sensitive. And you know the transistors were basically huge, like each integrated circuit had six transistors. So, you know, a few cosmic rays, it's not going to even notice. Was there any attempt to keep track of um, the parity? Like, you know, did they measure any error um, error rate or, um, during the flight? So, do you have any way of knowing that? You know. so, so, so if there was a parity error, it would you know trigger a, a parity alarm. So, you know, as far as I know, they didn't have any parity errors in, in flight. There you go. Um, so I have several um, questions are coming in. Um, how, how did they debug their instructions and programs? You talked briefly about that. Um, they had a whole separate unit, you said, uh, called the monitor, I believe it was. Yeah. So let me see if I can find the picture of that. And this would have been done before it was committed to rope, right? Yeah. So they could they could um, they could they could run simulations on on mainframes. Um, they had Apollo guidance computers set up, hooked up to you know simulated test setup. Um, you know, so they had like a simulated lunar lander they could go into and run the software. Um, so, you know, they were doing a lot of testing before they, they would commit it to rope because, you know, at that point you were kind of stuck. Um, were any of these, um, was there anything similar on the Gemini missions or anything that led up to the Apollo or was the Apollo fight the first one that had any serious computer on it? So, so the, the Gemini missions had a computer um, that was built by IBM and it was sim similar uh, more similar to the launch vehicle digital computer that was controlling the Saturn V stack. Um, the Apollo guidance computer, its um, predecessor was um, the Polaris missile um, computer. So, so the, the, um, both the Gemini and the Polaris, those were um, transistor based. And so they were, they were much similar, um, but there was a lot of 
you know, the if you look at the um, Polaris computer, you know, the physical construction is very, very similar to the Polo Guidance computer. The same idea of these modules that plug into a backplane. Great. Um, was there a, a temperature range? Um, were there any special heating or cooling requirements? So the computer, um, you know, it was, it was this, basically this um, magnesium block, and then it was mounted onto a, a cold plate that had um, cooling liquid flowing through through underneath. So that's um, how they kept the, the computer cool during during flight. So uh, when we were running it, you know, we would we would check to make sure it wasn't overheating, um, but you know, we didn't have any problems with that. You know, as a big block of metal, it, it's pretty good at radiating heat. Did you uh, find that? So what, one interesting thing about the one we have is that we discovered a hole that they had drilled into it so they could put in a thermocouple so that they could uh, measure the temperature during ground testing and make sure it was all okay. Um, did you find any particularly any interesting things on the rope memory that you acquired from various places? Um, so, so they, so they were different. They were slightly different versions of the software that had been scanned in from those big piles of listings. So, um, you know, they were. It, it was interesting to people like Mike who liked to trace the exact development of the software from from version to version, and he could see that, oh, there were some new features they added here versus there. Um, so so not, nothing, nothing too surprising, um, but it was still interesting to fill in these gaps. Great. And how did the guidance work on uh, unmanned missions? Um, I guess all the Apollo missions were manned, right? So, well, they, um, so was there any, um, um, was, did the agency fly on anything that was automated? Was there any real, and also was there any real time radio control from the ground? Or was it all controlled by the astronauts uh, locally? Well, um, so, so, so they also had, um, they could use radar from the ground to um, detect the position of the, of the Apollo. So they basically had you know, redundancy there. The Apollo guidance computer was calculating location and then ground was also calculating location via radar. And so the, the Apollo, um, they couldn't control it from ground, but you know, unmanned missions, you know, you know these, these missions grew out of um, you know, ICBMs, which were of course um, controlled by, controlled internally. So you know, it was kind of a combination of flights that were controlled by astronauts, things that were controlled on board or things that were controlled via the ground. There's a question here about how did welding of circuit components to the cord work construction work without damaging the components? Um, well, they, they used like basically electric spot welding. And so it was very concentrated heat just on the, on the wire. Um, you know, basically the same as you can, you know, solder a component at high heat without damaging it. You, you, can, you can do the spot welding and it won't damage it. And my understanding is that cordwood was used on a number of other um, electronics, not just not just this particular system that was um, um, right. It, it was uh, it was relatively popular until printed circuit boards took over. Um, it was it was very dense. Um, the problem was repairs were difficult because your circuitry is like not exposed. Um, CDC built a bunch of computers that used cordwood circuits. So they um, must have gotten pretty good at it. Yeah. Um, so Dave is wondering um, how many registers the computer had. He was looking at the monitor unit. So, so it, it had had about um, eight registers. Um, they all had like different purposes. You, you had um, you had the accumulator, which most things went through. You had register from your memory address, your memory data. You had a quotient register for doing multiplication and division. You know, it had hardware support for those. Um, it, it had a couple special purpose, uh, I think it was the X and Y register. So, you know, it, it, you know, it, it had a few registers, but not, not very much. You, you were basically using your core memory for all your, all your storage. And um, did you discover any Easter eggs in there, either software hardware, you know, in individuals' initials, comments in the code, um, 
nowadays I know people put stuff into the ICs, you know, little pictures and stuff. Do you find anything fun like that? Um, so, so there's some some there's some interesting things in the code that are you know, relatively well known. Um, you know, the code that starts the rocket engine is called Burn Baby. <laughs> you know, in the '60s, Burn Baby Burn was a was a saying, and so they they put that into the code. Uh, so the so, so the the code for the assembler that runs on the the the, the Honeywell mainframe. Um, that code is just full of these bizarre comments. Uh, I've, I've met the guy who wrote it and he has a strange sense of humor and that shows in the code. Uh, for instance, if you, have, if you have an error in the code you're assembling, it doesn't just tell you have an error. It prints out more, more and more um, sarcastic comments based on how many errors you have. So it has this like, whole collection of errors. So if you get like a lot of errors in your in your assembly, it will like give you criticisms and that has multiple criticisms that it selects randomly just to keep things interesting. So you know that's part of the code where he just kind of went overboard. Um, you know, that code was running on the mainframe on the ground. So you know there's plenty of space for putting in you know random stuff like this. We have a question about the power supply. So that was an early uh, switching power supply. How heavy was it? And what did they do? Any special engineering to make it lighter? So, so you, you know, you know, the power supply was you know mod, module about this big. Um, you know, I didn't weigh it, but you know, maybe about one pound. Um, you know, compared to you know, your modern phone charger, it's a lot heavier um, because you know they they had to use multiple transistors in, in parallel to support the current. Um, but compared to something with, um, you know, using large transformers, you know, it had these these tiny coils it used, uh, you know, relatively small capacitors. Uh, so, you know, that's what they did to to save on weight. Uh, you know, so, you know, I, I don't think there's you know, any other specifics that I could point to. So essentially what you're saying is the power supply may have been the lightest thing in the piece of the whole computer. <laughs> well, you know, it, it weighed about the same as, you know, a couple of the other modules. Yeah. You know, you know, they were trying to keep things lightweight, but, you know, the computer was still 70 pounds overall. Um, so it, it, it wasn't like, you know, crazy flimsy, like, like you might expect. You know, it was still pretty solidly built, you know, chunk of metal. I'm going to read this. This is from Wes. I frequently see questions online about, quote, how did the 4K 15-bit agency do all the calculations needed for a lunar mission? Um, he says, I know what I would say, but what would your response say? So how did it do everything? Well, basically, the, the course was all planned on the, on the ground. You know, they had IBM 360 mainframes, and they would spend months beforehand um, pulling out, you know, planning all the different courses and trajectories for different cases, so that the information that the Apollo guidance computer had to deal with, you know, it, it wasn't doing all this um, sort of on the fly, figuring out the best course. It would basically tell it where to go, and it would it would make sure you get there. Do you know if there are any surprises? Like, wow, we should have uh, um, had a, a verb for this other than the, the famous um, problem that you already talked about, about too many interrupts, um, so, it so, pretty much do the job then. So, so basically for each um, mission, they would you know, you know, fix some problems, make some improvements. And so the, you know, the software was constantly changing from mission to mission. Um, you know, that's part of the reason why it was interesting to read these old core ropes to see when these changes happened. So, you know, they, they made improvements to the um, uh, to the guidance, especially for landing on the surface of the moon, um, making that more efficient, um, giving the astronauts more control, make it easier to select exactly where you want to land. Um, they they found a few bugs along the way that they would fix. So it was basically this you know constant changes throughout the throughout the time. Do you have a feel for how busy the astronauts were on the computer? Were they constantly doing, you know, poking, poking at it, or is it they'd go for hours without doing anything and then suddenly have to do a whole bunch or? So I, I think it was, you know, more, more bursty that they, 
they, they could go for long periods of time without having to do a thing. And then they would have to, you know, put in a whole bunch of commands all at once. You know, when they get, you know, a new course from the ground, they would have to put in all the data. So they would they basically go through this, you know, checklist to update your XYZ positions, your angles. So they, they might be entering hundreds of different numbers at that point. Um, let's see. So what was the most important point of system design advice that you would give the engineers at Blue Edge? Blue Origin or SpaceX or all that, that you learned from this? Did you learn anything that, that modern uh, designers could use? Well, I, you know, I think if you, you know, if, if they could get to the moon with 43,000 instructions per second, I think you know, SpaceX has no excuse. You know, they've got <laughs> enough computing power, they should be able to do whatever they need. Uh, you know, but, but, but seriously, I think, you know, the main point is that you just have to, you know, test everything, test thoroughly, be able to handle handle problems that are unexpected, make sure you can recover from anything quickly, um, make sure that you have backups in place. So, so for instance, with the Apollo guidance computer, you know, even if the computer failed totally, you know, they still had the radar on the ground they could use for guidance. Um, they, if they were you know, approaching the moon surface, the, the board guidance system, that computer would get them back, back, uh, back out into space. Um, they had, you know, lots of um, sort of manual procedures. You know, if, if the Apollo guidance computer couldn't give them the docking information, they could get that from the ground. If they couldn't get it from the ground, they had um, basically like paper lists they could go through and do the calculations manually. So, so you know, they really, had like multiple ways of doing everything. So the design was once complement and the unit did integer math. So all floating point abilities were in routines, um, um, presumably, or in the interpreter. Yeah. So. And you said triple precision. Uh, when would they need that? Um, well, you know, something like, I mean, Single precision, you only have you know fifteen bits. So, oh, that's right. Yeah. So, so triple precision isn't a whole lot of bits. Um, <laughs> Good point. So you know, triple precision there would be you know less than single precision nowadays. So 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 yeah, basically they had to build their own own you know sine algorithms, cosine algorithms in assembly, and then they could use those from the interpreter. Um, here's one. I recall the LEM that made a radical attitude change. Uh, was that an agency issue or an input thing? And um, was I um, doesn't remember that which mission that was. I, I'm not familiar with that particular issue. So, so I, I, I think the one that question is referring to is, is Apollo 10, where they, they like got to the moon, but they didn't do a complete landing. They just orbited the moon and came back. Um, but they started spinning in random directions, um, basically because they had a switch set wrong on, on the Apollo guidance computer. And so it took them a couple seconds to get that straightened out. But during that time, they were like you know, swiveling in, in random directions. Yeah, I tried to imagine what that's like in zero gravity. You're moving around, you're trying to think, and then you have to figure out what switch to hit. And the astronauts are yeah. amazing and still are amazing people. Uh, speaking of which, if the astronauts had tens or hundreds of inputs, how did they sanity check the astronauts? <laughs> I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, Alan. <laughs> how did they sanity check what? The astronauts. Um, <laughs> maybe if you want to <laughs> add to that question, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, Alan. So, so I, I assume that means, you know, how did it not drive the astronauts crazy entering hundreds of numbers? Yeah, that could, and yeah. You know, I guess it just takes the right kind of personality to you know patiently type in hundreds of numbers and then read them back and make sure they're okay. Yep. Um, let's see. So um, one um, so one computer would survive each trip because it was in the command uh, module and it would ultimately land back on Earth. Are any of those um, computers extant in any kind of shape or condition? So I believe those are all still inside the command modules in museums, and they wouldn't let us play with them. <laughs> Nuts, right? Um, 
Okay, um, any other questions out there? I know I could probably keep asking questions all night. Oh, here's one. What kinds of notable bug fixes have been discovered through the years and how many bugs improvements were made from mission to mission? So I don't know if you kept a tally of that. I know you said each one had some improvements. Um, so, so, you know, there, there was there, there was one um, bug that they found after Apollo eleven um, was that the the engine characteristics that they had been given by the manufacturer um, didn't match what the engine actually did, and so it was like very close to going into oscillation between what the computer was telling the engine to do, and what the engine actually did, and so they were basically lucky that it worked. And so then that, that was you know, one of the things that they had to fix. Um, another um, was, I believe, Apollo 14, um, the abort switch. Um, when you're headed down to the moon surface, if you hit the abort button, it will, the abort system will take over and put you back into space. Um, they discovered on the way to the moon that there was a loose solder ball inside that switch, randomly shorting it out. Oh, dear. And so, you know, if that solder ball hit the switch on the way to the surface, they would just, you know, shoot right back. And so um, they, they had to basically figure out a patch to the software that would um, keep that from happening. And then they had to um, read that patch to the astronauts who would then punch it into the disky and, and patch it to basically disable that. And so, so they were... That implies that there was some some ability to do some programming on the fly. Well, limited amount. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously they couldn't, you know, patch what was in the core rope, but there was um, a way. I think there was like a vector that went through the RAM that they could then update, and they were able to, um, to convince the computer that the button had already been pressed. So if it got pressed, it would ignore it, <laughs> and so. So, so I, I met the the guy Don Isles, the programmer who you know came up with this, you know, basically this hack in a few hours, and gave it to the astronauts, and you know it, it was successful. And that but was on, on which mission? That was on, I believe that was fourteen. Fourteen. Okay, so that was a little later on. Yeah. But did um, um, did you get to meet very many of the original hardware and software people? I know you've mentioned a few. Um, so, so um, yeah, we actually were um, the the programming team at MIT. They had a 50th anniversary event, and so we took the Apollo guidance computer there and you know showed it off to the people. And so we were able to meet um, you know dozens of the programmers and the hardware designers. And you know we could ask why did you use these bizarre obscure connectors? And so it, it was you know very interesting to meet these people. You know they loaned us some some ropes that we could then read. And they were, of course, interested to see the computer working after all these years. Did you get to meet Margaret Hamilton? Um, no, she she was off doing other things. She, you know, She's become very famous. And so she had, you know, I don't know, meeting with the president or something. Yeah, she is quite, quite famous and, and deservedly so. Um, mm -hmm. All around, it was an amazing effort because once again, this started, um, in 61 or 62, the actual design and was flying by, um, when was the first Apollo flight, 68 or 67? Yeah, yeah, the landing was, um, was landing 69. 69. And you know, I think they had, they had it going a couple of years before that. So that's an, an astounding development effort right there. Yeah, especially when it's like unproven technology you're basically you're know, creating the IC industry as you go. You know when they started, they had no idea of the reliability of the integrated circuits. You know companies still hadn't figured out how to manufacture them reliably. You know how how do you seal the package so they don't leak? You know that was one of my big concerns when I started this project. You know will all these integrated circuits have leaked over fifty years and none of them work? And it, it turns out that we only had one integrated circuit that was a problem. Um, there was a short circuit inside it. I suggested we could try shaking it, see if that fixed it, and it did. So, <laughs> and when I was in sixth grade, which would have been approximately 1966, we had a speaker from NASA, and he held up a rack of electronics and said, "In order for us to get to the moon, we have to shrink this like 30 times or something." 
Of course, I was too young to take note of exactly what that was, but obviously they succeeded beyond anyone's wildest dreams since then. I, was, I carried that memory with me all these years. It was very, you know, made a big impression. Of course, being my age, we were all in the space, you know, we we're all mm -hmm. in love with this stuff. Um, let's see, uh, are there any um, other questions? Now is a good time uh, to uh, pop up. Um, ask questions, otherwise we're gonna uh, uh, wrap up here. Um, Ken, can you make the slides available as well? Um, yeah, let, let me, I'll, I'll send you a link. Yeah, just send me a link. Um, it always takes me a few days to get the um, uh, recording uploaded to YouTube. Um, and I'll send you a link to that, Ken, before I release it to the public. Um, I wanna thank you very much for taking the time to do this. I found the whole project fascinating. Um, I love everyone saying, thank you, Ken. I'll take that too. No, thank you, Ken. <laughs> and, um, and thank you all for joining us um, from all over. Um, and perhaps we'll see some of you at future events. Um, Ken, I'll continue to follow what, what you do and perhaps someday get to meet you in, in person. Uh, unless there are any last minute uh, questions, we will um, call this a wrap. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, well, thanks for having me here. That was um, absolutely fascinating. That's great, great work. I'm glad you found this fantastic hobby and other people who share it. And um, I'll just say that there's a lot of information about this on, on the web. A lot of people doing restorations of all kinds of computers. Um, and it's really a lot of fun. So um, Ken, thank you uh, very much. Okay, take care. All right, over and out, everyone. Thank you all.